the Police Advisory um, Committee will now call to order. Um, we have a pretty exciting day today because we do get to hear a presentation. Recent evolution of law enforcement. Thank you, Chief, for doing this for us today. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do, uh, the meeting, the minutes from December's meeting was sent out to everybody, so everyone should have had a chance to look through that. I'm just wondering if there's any suggestions or comments for those minutes before we get those approved. Nothing. Hearing nothing. Move no approval. questions. We're up I'll there. Second. All right. Great. Approved. Woohoo. <laughs> <laughs> minutes for December 14th are approved by PAC. We'll sign these now. <coughs> Hello. Come on in. Okay, so I think the first thing we're going to do today is the presentation. So, Chief, would you mind just uh, going right into this presentation for us? Sure. And if you don't mind, well, let's see. Can I see from here? Can everybody see? Yeah, I can click from here. Can everybody see all right? You need me to move. Uh, so this was actually uh, uh, an amended version of a presentation uh, WSU Police Chief Bill Gardner and I made at the request of uh, the coordinator for the WSU's Common Reading Program. And they have uh, speakers come in throughout the year to talk on the subject that they have uh, for the common reading uh, program and um, so they, they did give us a little bit of leeway in exactly what we talked about and so we we thought that this would be a, a good topic based on just recent events nationally that are really focusing on law enforcement um, so this is one that um, that I've made uh, once since uh, and uh, service clubs will sometimes ask me to come speak, and this will this will be the one that I'll use the first part of this year uh, for those presentations. So, you know, when I meet with groups, I ask them to think about their their experiences with law enforcement and and think about what things have shaped their perceptions of law enforcement. And sometimes it's a matter of, of where you grew up. Um, if you grew up in a big city with a lot of crime or maybe you grew up in a small town with not a lot of crime or a rural area uh, maybe you grew up where you had no contact with law enforcement or maybe you grew up where you had uh, maybe some positive contacts with law enforcement maybe you have a family member who's in law enforcement so there's a lot of different things that can can shape everyone's perspective of, of law enforcement including a bad experience with law enforcement um, Sometimes people shape their perceptions of law enforcement on television shows or the news. So a lot of times there's what I would call a defining event that, that um, causes change in law enforcement and law enforcement's relationship with their communities. <clears throat> so one that is in recent memory, and this was, um, I've been a police officer since the late 70s, so this was, uh, I'd been on the force for quite a few years when this happened. So Rodney King was in one of those events that really, you know, it focused attention on law enforcement uh, and, uh, and caused a lot of change in law enforcement. So, you know, prior to Rodney King, there was really, there seemed to be a lot of what I would call unconditional trust of law enforcement. So essentially communities would say, you know, we want the police to deal with crime. We don't necessarily want to know how you do it. We just want you to do it. And so there was, that was kind of given to, to law enforcement to, to take care of business as they saw fit. So Rodney King kind of brought uh, an examination of that, say, you know, maybe it does matter how police do their work. And so this kind of started the growth of what we call community policing today. And, and um, so there was a, you know, a lot more interaction between law enforcement agencies and the communities that they served and uh, trying to build that trust uh, within their communities. And transparency became important. You know, be, before Rodney King, I, I won't say it was completely unimportant, but 
definitely it brought a lot of focus to, to transparency and what police uh, departments did, what police officers did, and how they did their job, um, and that they could be trusted in their communities. So bring you know, forward to 2015, Ferguson is kind of the Rodney King of today. Um, we, we've had not just Ferguson, but different events that have happened that has brought focus on, on law enforcement, of how law enforcement does their jobs, um, and how they relate with their communities. Um, and so, you know, it causes us in law enforcement to really to re-examine, you know, what, how we are relating to our communities, are we providing the service that our communities want us to, um, are we uh, providing it in the manner that they want us to. Uh, we, we've talked uh, last year about the report on 21st century policing. Uh, Obama brought together um, a group, uh, a committee to put together this report that is really a, a blueprint or a roadmap for law enforcement moving forward. Um, and we've, uh, I've sent that report out to the committee uh, for your review. And so those are things that we're looking at in our department uh, about how we're kind of shaping our future and what things that we want to focus on um, and different ways of, you know, continuing to build that trust in our community. Uh, one of the things that, that you've heard before and you'll, you'll continue to hear a lot about is something called procedural justice. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And also a mentality of going from warrior to guardian. And, um, you know, in the academies from years past, it's really been a, the primary focus has really been an officer safety focus, which, it, which isn't a bad thing, but it really kind of developed this us versus them mentality. So, you know, it's us and law enforcement versus everybody else. Uh, and the transition now is to what's called the guardian mentality, where it's really, you know, we're, we're guardians of our community and we're guardians of the Constitution. And so, you know, there's some subtle differences there. And uh, Washington State really is, is a leader in this. Um, the uh, Sue Rohr, who is the head of the Washington State Criminal Justice Training Commission and the police academy here, is a previous King County sheriff, and she was. Uh, one of the members that was selected to be on that committee, uh, the presidential committee. And so she, it was obvious that she had a lot of input into the, the final product because talking about uh, going, moving from warrior to guardian um, is very um, prominent in the report. Uh, there's also some generational things that are happening. You know, um, years ago, you know, uh, Authority was kind of if you had a title you, you were given authority and and you know now really authority really has to be earned You know that trust has to be earned. It's not just um, uh, Given to anyone because they're they have a certain title of police officer or whatever the title is So there's a lot of talk about ethnic makeup of, of police departments and when I give the presentation we kind of get into a discussion about you know, <clears throat> is that a good thing to do? Or are there some negatives to that? Because um, there are advantages and disadvantages. And uh, but I, you know, I think generally the consensus is that that's a good thing to try to do is to have a, a law enforcement agency try to mirror uh, their their community or, or try to uh, match their community as far as the ethnic makeup and have some similar representation on, on the police department. Uh, and I use Baltimore as an example. So if you look at this under the community column, that's that's the community makeup. So uh, generally speaking, uh, there's 62% uh, uh, of the makeup are black and 28% white. And the police department, 40% uh, black, 51% white. So this looks like they're they're they don't completely match up. But what I will tell you is, as far as large cities go, Baltimore is probably way ahead of most other. Uh, law, law enforcement agencies and trying to match their community uh, with the ethnic makeup. Um, so they, they probably are just as good or better than most large cities in the U.S. So my point in bringing Baltimore to this is, is even though they've, they've come a really long way into doing this, look at what's going on in Baltimore and look at what's going on in Baltimore. In fact, there's a trial going on right now with officers that are accused of um, of killing someone in their custody uh, and they've had riots there and so uh, you know I just bring this up to, to to let you think about you know is that really going to solve the problem and 
while I personally think it's it's helpful and it's a good goal to to try to achieve, um, it's not a it's not a panacea. It's not the thing you know. It's it's not something that's going to resolve issues between police and their communities. There's also some inherent um, disconnect, is what I call it, between law enforcement and, and communities, and that's that's because of the nature of the job. So first, I would say that we, you know, it's important to have a shared trust, that we have the trust of our community, and we're able to, um, uh, to interact with and, uh, and have a mutual trust between the community and police department. But because of the nature of our job, there's some things that we do in our job uh, because of the inherent risks that kind of are not um, conducive to having this connection with the community. And just a simple thing to look at is a traffic stop. Uh, you know, any traffic stop an officer makes could be the last, you know, just before their death because, you know, we, we see it all the time across the nation that if somebody wants to kill a police officer and they sit there in their car and they have a weapon and an officer walks up, I mean, that could be it right there. And so officers are trained to, you know, the, to watch out and try to uh, engage in some type of officer safety until they have a good feel for what they're really dealing with. Um, because if they do drop their guard, uh, then it could be the end of their life. I mean, there's a lot at stake. So just the inherent risk to law enforcement officers and uh, having an officer safety approach sometimes doesn't allow for that good positive connection. And so that's why it's important for us to try to take advantage of as many opportunities as, as we can to have those positive connections because a lot of our interaction with uh, with people in the public are not uh, necessarily positive, they're adversarial, um, and so it, uh, they're not always going to have that, uh, that positive connection. And we kind of, you know, joke around with the fire department because, you know, just about 100% of their activities are positive. They're helping, they're always there helping somebody. They're not putting the handcuffs on somebody and taking them or their loved one to jail uh, or writing them a ticket. Um, so it's, it's, it's a difficult task for law enforcement to do that. So it's something that we continually have to concentrate on. Um, and so there's, there's a balance there. You know, we, de we definitely don't want to tell officers to drop their officer safety and, and uh, just try to have positive connections with people because um, there is that risk. Uh, talked a little bit about stereotyping, and it's, uh, I don't think a lot of people have thought of this before, but um, police officers can identify people who feel that they're victims of stereotyping because we're victims of it every day. I mean, all you have to do is watch the news and say, oh, the police did this, and now we're all lumped together in one group because of the uniform we wear. Um, so uh, it's just something for people to think about. So there's some things in technology that, that help uh, our transparency with the with our communities and our connection with our communities and one of the things that we've done is the body worn cameras um, you know some other benefits to it as far as the efficiency of the criminal justice system and um, timely resolution to criminal cases um, transparency with the public um, complaint resolution if if someone comes in to make a complaint against an officer we can tell really quickly whether that is a valid complaint or not and whether we need to address officer conduct or whether it's unfounded. And so um, that takes a lot of stress off, off the officers. And um, it also reduces the amount of uh, baseless complaints. And we can also determine if we do need to address officer conduct. Um, we don't have to just take anyone's word for it, even the officers anymore. It's, it's all on video. We also use it for use of force review. And so right, what we had been doing is any time an officer used any type of force uh, on anyone, whether it's um, uh, holding their arm behind their back when they're arresting them, up to using um, a taser or a mace or even their firearm, officers have to not only include that in their police report, but they have to fill out a, an extra use of force uh, re, uh, report form, which goes to our operations commander. And he would review the police report and uh, determine whether the use of force was within our policy. Uh, and then I would, I would review the final result. 
So now what we do is the same, although the reports forms are still done, but when the operations commander gets that use of force review form, he now goes to the video and every officer that was at the scene, he reviews all of their videos. And so instead of just reading someone's police report, he can go and see what actually happened and make that determination about use of force. So it's a much more positive and robust way to, to have a, a use of force review and ensure officers are within policy. Agencies that, um, you know, I looked at our use of force numbers and our numbers aren't real high, so it's kind of hard to judge, but I've seen studies from larger departments that, you know, have hundreds and hundreds of officers and they found that when they implemented body-worn cameras that their use of force incidents uh, declined. Our officers also use it for debriefing so that when they go on an incident they can come back and look and see if uh, how they handle things and if they can do something better the next time. Um, and there's times that officers will, will actually look at a video and say, you know, I can see now from someone else's perspective how I was perceived by them and I could have handled that better. I could have engaged with that community member better or, or handled the situation better. And then also just for tactical reasons of you know, handling certain types of calls. And of course there's a lot of challenges when you employ these things, um, uh, particularly body-worn cameras now as far as legal issues, um, policy issues privacy issues, both to officers and the public. Uh, we have to store and manage all of the video. <coughs> we have to comply with all the state public record, record retention requirements. Um, respond to public records requests for video. So there's a lot, lot involved. Um, there's, there's not just the upside, there's also the, the downside too. <coughs> so also a little bit about perception and reality. So, it kind of seems obvious that, say, as a, as a police department, <coughs> excuse me, we're here to address crime. And so, we, we look at the crime rate and see if we have an impact on the crime rate. And of course, our ability to be effective relies a lot on the cooperation within the community. The more cooperation we have, the more effective we can be. But the other part of that is, is public's perception. So we could have a really low crime rate, but if the community doesn't feel safe, then we're not doing our job because part of what we have to do besides keeping the, uh, addressing crime is also to make the community feel safe. And the reverse is true. We could have uh, the crime rate um, really, uh, what I start with, crime rate uh, low, but if, is that what I already said? If we have a high crime rate, um, and the community, but the community says, oh, we still feel safe. We're still not doing our job. You know, we have to do both. So um, it's a matter of, uh, of doing both of those. And so I talk about that because it, the, the same is true with, with, uh, with perceptions of discrimination and bias. So we have to determine in our agency, is there a discrimination and bias going on? But let's say we determine, you know, we, we don't think there's any discrimination bias going on. It doesn't matter if the public thinks there's discrimination bias going on. So the point of all this is really we have to address perception and reality. So regardless of whether the crime rate's low or we don't, I don't believe we have bias in the police department, if the public doesn't feel that way, then we have to work to address the public perception of that because that's really the bottom line. How does the community feel? So a little bit more on the guardians of democracy part. Again, we, t we talked about warrior to guardian before, uh, and us versus them. This is also something that's taught in the, in the police academy now. It's called lead, listen, and explain with equity and dignity. Again, it's that uh, mutual respect, developing uh, trust. So procedural justice, uh, the bottom line on that is that people do care how they're treated by police. It's not just the police getting the job done, but they care how they're treated. So under procedural justice, there's four, there's four tenets to procedural justice. So it's treating people with dignity and respect, giving individuals a voice during encounters, being neutral and transparent in decision making, and conveying trustworthy motives. So again, this is all, it's more than just doing these things. We have to do it in a way so that, that, 
that the community and the public feel that that's what we're doing. So moving forward, you know, training is something that, that we in law enforcement do all the time. I mean, we just, we train, train, train. Um, but when we talk about things about um, procedural justice and having connection with the community and, um, uh, and earning trust, uh, having ethical behavior, um, I'm, I'm convinced that there's very little we can do training-wise to impact those things. Um, so what can we do? So in my opinion, it has more to do with the police department and their culture and values. And so how do, we, how do we impact that? So the way that I see it is that I, I start that from, I, I don't wait till after we hire somebody and then we say we're gonna train them and show them this and that. We start from recruitment and the type of person that we look for and that, and that we try to recruit um, based on, on our values. And so we start it from the very beginning before we even hire somebody. Um, we do it with the hiring process and the firing process. Again, this is all part of our uh, incorporate part of our values and, and the, the type of person that we're looking for, not just someone that can go and we think can do the job, um, but how are they going to do the job and, and what are their values. Um, we incorporated our performance evaluation system. Um, we've completely re revised our evaluation system in the last few years. Uh, we've moved, uh, when I came here, our performance evaluations were really focused on numbers and um, and production and, and you know the numbers that officers could perform and we've gone completely away we still use we still look at productivity as part of a measurement tool but our focus now really uh, is on the quality of the officers work and their and the quality of the contacts that they have in the community and addressing problems working with the community to solve problems so that's that's our focus now same with our reward and discipline system. So that, those are the things that we reward. So you all know our mission statement. And this was um, a year and a half ago, we had a, a, a team building workshop. We brought in a facilitator to work with our management team over two and a half days. And one of the things that we wanted to do was develop a mission statement. What we wanted something that said what really what really represented us and what we wanted to stand for and this is something that as a group all of our so it's all of the uh, the sergeants the commander and I and our and our support services manager we all work together on this and, and this is what we came up with and I, and I show this a lot because I'm really proud of of it um, that the group came up with this I mean I if I were to sit down and write something, and I wrote this, I, I would think that would be great. I, you know, then I need to go sell it. But I didn't have to do that because this is something that the whole group uh, came up with together and felt, yeah, this represents us. Uh, and then we also came up with values. And, and uh, again, I'm really proud of those. I really like the, the values that our agency feels that that represents. So now. You know, and everything that we do, again, all the way from recruitment, all the way up to hiring and firing, and our performance evaluation system, um, uh, rewards and punishments, this is what we look at now. So anything that, that our officers do and we try to determine whether that was something that we value, we gauge it against this. And so um, I think this puts us in a good spot to move forward along with the, uh, with the policeman in the 21st century report, and because this... I think this embodies a lot of what uh, that report uh, was trying to say about what we want in our, our law enforcement officers. So that is the presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have. I've actually got a couple, sir. Um, so you were talking about Ferguson earlier, and then obviously we're discussing community policing. How do you think uh, militarization of police forces has a uh, that? Again, I think that's a perception and reality kind of thing because, you know, for example, we just saw in San Bernardino the deployment of military type vehicles that used by uh, officers that protected them while they um, incapacitated some very dangerous people. 
So um, I think that helps show that there's a, um, a value, there's a value to those in when in situations um, that they would be applicable. So I think it's a matter of law enforcement trying to address the perception of that. Um, but you know, and not, but also I think there's a there's a time and a place for different tactics and different equipment. Um, and and I don't know all the details about the Ferguson issue. I, you know, I know that there's uh, uh, issues, uh, discussion about whether the police were too, um, I guess, militarized initially when. There were some disturbances that were started or demonstrations. Um, and I guess there's always a potential to be accused of overreacting. Um, and I know back when, in fact, in the Rodney King riots, there was uh, the LAPD was accused of underreacting. Um, so sometimes those things are, are hard to, to get right. Um, so I, it's just a matter of, I think, balancing that perception and reality. And the second question, um, something I can relate to a little bit, uh, the Army has had some issues with encouraging people to sometimes go against their leadership in cases of like rape or internal disturbances or something like that. Uh, when we saw the events of like Serpico that happened a long time ago, we saw that police departments had a similar issue of um, people being able to turn on their own sort of thing and uh, having that, that blue line not being able to be crossed. You know, you, you kind of lose, you know, respect internally and kind of end your career basically. How do you think police departments should address that issue or how do you, does your police department address that issue? So, so again, I think it gets down to, uh, I don't think there's a, an answer that will cover law enforcement in general, to be honest right. with you. Uh, I think there are huge differences in the different geographical regions of the country about uh, cultures of police departments. Um, and then there's differences just between individual police departments. And so um, I think that's something that does need um, attention, generally speaking. Uh, but each individual department needs to address that within their own agency mm -hmm. and ensure that the culture there um, promotes the, the values that um, that will not support officers who are um, doing things that they shouldn't be doing, uh, or try to or try to hide that type of activity. Um, and you know, and that's I, I guess that's one of the positives of, of body worn cameras. And there's uh, if there was a way to hide things, there's just it's there's becoming less and less have the ability to do that anymore so um, but uh, you know I think that's an important <coughs> I think that's an important issue to, to keep at the forefront um, I don't think that's a, a huge issue for us here but I know it's likely you know a, a huge issue in some agencies thank you I think the public just gets little snippets of police activity too as uh, by the way very good presentation I thought mm -hmm. but uh, I, I thought an action of police action out of control was that black woman that died in the uh, Prairie View, Texas, when the officer was, yeah. I think, manhandling her. And then yesterday or day before yesterday, this officer in Philadelphia, boy, you, you talk about courage and dedication. And I see one of these things, and I think, boy, that guy isn't doing his job. And I see this other thing. There's a guy I really admire. Yeah. So. Yeah, and, and it gets back to how you have your perception of law enforcement because, you know, I think for a while there we were seeing just snippet after snippet of officers doing something wrong. And so, you know, after a while people get the idea, wow, this is, this is law enforcement. And, you know, that just isn't the case. Um, so, um, I forgot where I was going to go with that, but, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, that's, um, that's an issue in, in the news definitely is, is when these, well, that's where I was going to go. You know, the, so the ones that we see um, and that are being addressed, you know, we, you can, we can debate about the criminal justice system part of once it gets, if it goes before a grand jury and what happens there, you know, that, that's a whole other issue. But the fact that uh, <coughs> police departments 
do hold officers accountable, um, even if, when they've done something wrong, I think those are the ones to be celebrated. It's the ones that we don't even know about, I think, are the ones we need to worry about because they're not being brought to the forefront for whatever reason. And a lot of times it could be because the department it's themselves are, are trying to hide it or they have a culture where it's okay to, to you know, support fellow officers that are doing things wrong. Th those are the ones that we need to be concerned about. You know, that, you know, like if something were to happen at Pullman PD and an officer gets arrested for something or, or you know, fired for something, um, then I think that, you know, it's a bad thing to happen, but it's a good sign that the proper thing was done to address it rather than trying to sweep it under the rug and not let anybody find out about it or, or not doing any, any, anything about it. Samantha. Yeah, um, so obviously like at the university we have students that come from everywhere and everywhere like you're saying perceptions are different of police. So something I've kind of been thinking about and talking to you about is how we can like help to bridge that gap when students first come here who already have those preconceived notions that may come from a place like LA or New York where there's just a very different feel with the police. Um, and so I guess kind of what do you think we can do to build a better like relationship with students who come from other places? Yeah, and, uh, and that's a really good point. In fact, I usually specifically mention that at the beginning part when we talk about perceptions because we deal with that here a lot <coughs> because we have people from all over, not just are all over the US but other countries too. Uh, so we, we've, we're trying to get more involved in like the Alive program so that we can have some kind of contact with students and parents at the, at the very onset of their, you know, time here at WSU. Um, but, you know, we, I know they have so much information for them to do in such a short period of time. You know, we're very limited on time. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's something that we try to get out there with and also with fraternities and sororities and in, in the other student groups. But uh, I'm, I'm open to any ideas about, you know, trying to um, work on that relationship when students first get here. Uh, because it does, can cause problems later on if there's an issue and uh, that the police are involved. And so now they're thinking, okay, how the police handled it in my hometown is not necessarily the way it's handled here. I've got one question and one comment, and I guess the comment first is um, you're mentioning changing the performance evaluations, and I'm aware that it's a lot harder to perform an evaluation where you talk <coughs> about quality, because that's harder to define than numbers, and so I think that's fabulous that you've done that. I also realize it's hard work to do. And then the question is, uh, when you were talking about the use of force review, do all police departments review all uses of force the way we do? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I know the department where I used to work, we did a similar type of a review. Um, but, um, so I, I don't know. I don't know what other departments do. You know, it's, a, it's one of those areas that where there's a, I think there's a high expectation for officers' performance, and so, you know, I think we're obligated to ensure that they maintain those standards. Um, but where that falls in other departments, um, I don't know. Okay, thank you. So one statement um, from your presentation was that uh, generally people have argued that a police department uh, matching their community would have a better interaction with the community in itself. At least I think that's what I, you were going at with that. Um, how closely does Pullman's police department match the community and do you think that there's anything that would improve that reflection when it comes to the department and the community interaction? Um. Well, let's see. Right now, I think we only have um, we have one um, uh, Hispanic officer. Uh, we have one female officer. So, because of the size of our department and the makeup of Pullman, just having one officer automatically kind of skews it. I mean, we're overrepresented with with uh, Hispanic, and we're over. Well, we're not overrepresented with females. But um, if we had any other minority, right, so without a minority, we're underrepresented. <coughs> Even just adding one minority officer would make us overrepresented because we have very um, small percentages of uh, minority residents here. 
Um, so, you know, I, I don't, I don't necessarily want to uh, want a goal of matching. I, I, I think it's good to have a goal to have a diverse law enforcement agency. So I would love to hire more um, uh, minority officers um, and more female officers. Uh, the difficulty is getting applicants uh, from minority applicants and female applicants. Uh, we get, you know, our numbers are much higher in, in um, non-minority male applicants for police officer, uh, you know, than any other group. I think those numbers are starting to change, but, you know, I'll have to say that, you know, with, with things that have gone on the last couple of years, um, I mean, I'm not surprised that minority officers aren't applying to police departments because they continue to hear that how terrible law enforcement is to minorities, and so um, why would they want a career in that? So we, you know, we really need to address that perception. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd love to have a more diverse, diverse force. Thank you. Well, that was a very great presentation. Thank you. Is there any other questions? All right. Thank you again. That's, Fantastic. Yeah, it was great. It was great to hear that. So. Um, next, we're going to be looking at a flyer that we've been slowly putting together and talking about. Um, I did update it. I put a picture on there. Obviously, not everyone is in that picture. <coughs> Sorry about that. But we will bring the camera next time and be taking another uh, session of photos so please come so we can make it look like you know more representative <laughs> so um, please look that over let me know if you have any quick comments um, I thought about putting specifically the email address below the learn more I think we had mentioned that at the last meeting but we're undecided as of whether or not we were just going to put a link to have the information or if we were going to actually put our email address and stuff like that on there this is something like we were talking about distributing at local coffee shops local small businesses to just not necessarily to get people to come but just so that they more so know that we're here as a resource if they ever have a concern or they're thinking about something they know they need addressed questions comments it looks great looks good Simple to the point. Yeah. 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 Um, do you guys want anything added or changed to this besides maybe updating photo with more people in it? More people. <laughs> All right. Great. That was easier than I thought it would be. I thought everyone would have some something to say about it. So, um, so maybe we should look to approving that at the next meeting then and then approving to get it distributed at that point. And then we can also talk more personally about where specifically we want it distributed for sure. And we can also kind of pass them out. Well, I think the chief is going to be tired of talking. I but run up there. <laughs> so we can now move on to the police. I keep hearing this echo. The police department update. Does everyone hear that, or is it just me? It, it's from the recording system. OK. <laughs> so you all met Rob Baker, who's uh, a information services technician. And um, he'll be recording the meetings to be posted to YouTube. Uh, one question that he had was whether you wanted to have these rebroadcast on Time Warner cable, which they have the ability. They do those, I believe, for the council meetings, and so they all they have to do is submit it and <coughs> rebroadcast them at different intervals. No extra cost. Right. I, you know, I don't believe it costs anything. I think it's no cost. That sure. That'd be my question. It would help get us out there. Yeah, in the community. Okay. I'll follow up with Rob on that. Do you know what where they broadcast it? Well, I think there's a isn't there a city channel? I don't have oh, time. Channel channel, Twelve. But there's a city channel. Have any objections to that or want to discuss that? We could think about it a little bit and then move to do that next time if you want, or we can just go for it. Try it. He's offering us to take advantage of that. Yeah. All We're right. Like posting on the internet, like, <laughs> it's not really us. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if we have to sign any kind of release for each individual or not to be using 
our faces. I don't, yeah, I don't think so since this is a public meeting. Yeah, we're already putting it on there anyway. Next. <laughs> so. It's not being used for promotional purposes or any business like that. Okay, do I hear a motion to put it on the local channel? Yeah, I'll well? motion for that. I'll second. second. All right, the motion carries. So our uh, negotiations, as you may remember, uh, labor negotiations, uh, contract was settled with support. So the police department is divided into two groups, support and uniformed. So support uh, came to an agreement, and when that was ratified by city council. Um, there's a tentative agreement now with uniformed and it goes to city council tomorrow night and so if council approves that tomorrow night then we'll have an agreement with uniform and that will take us to 20 through 2017 oh, on uh, December 21st uh, commander tenant and I met with um, Adam Jessel from WSU Student Conduct, as well as the county prosecuting attorney and representative from uh, WSU PD, just to touch base on all of our collective efforts and to just to make sure that all of our efforts were, were complementing each other properly um, between student conduct and enforcement efforts of the police departments and uh, the prosecuting attorney with prosecuting cases and also the diversion program. So we just met to talk about those things and. Uh, we'll probably do something similar on an annual basis just to make sure that we're all on the same page. We just had a records, one of our records specialists resigned to take a position at WSU. So uh, we uh, will be going to the Civil Service Commission on the 20th, January 20th, uh, to get their approval to conduct a recruitment to replace that record specialist. So. Uh, we'll start a, a recruitment. We'll probably uh, advertise it for about four weeks, and then we'll uh, interview the, the top applicants, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to get somebody hired here in the next few months. We are getting ready to deploy cell, uh, cell phones, smartphones, to all of our patrol people. Right now, um, our detectives have <coughs> phones and um, the sergeants have phones and some admin people have phones. So we're gonna deploy these to patrol and some of the advantages of that is for one, they'll all have a, dedica a dedicated contact number so that uh, victims, witnesses, and the public can contact an officer directly. Um, right now on their body-worn cameras, they have to come into the police station and look at their video and then we they have to tag their videos with case numbers and the type of case it is so that we can manage the videos so with the with the smartphones they can actually look at their videos and tag them while they're out in the field still so they don't have to come into the police station and do that uh, um, and so that's gonna I think save a lot of time uh, we're also going to be replacing our evidence cameras that we carry in patrol right now because we're going to use these as cameras for evidence uh, and so they'll be able to upload those two directly from their phone out in the field to uh, evidence.com. Uh, uh, and so that'll actually be a cost savings on the evidence cameras. So there'll be a lot of advantages. Uh, so I'm looking forward to, to doing that. I don't, I don't know. I've been asking around to see what other departments are doing as far as technology, and I haven't heard anyone that has started to do that. They've done it on a limited basis. So I think we're a little bit ahead of the curve on that, and I think it'll work out really well. So I don't remember if I mentioned this before, but it wasn't long after our 2016 budgets were approved that we were asked to put together some suggestions on where we want to cut our 2016 budgets. <laughs> so they, I think they figured out that some of the initial revenue projections are not going to be as positive as they initially thought. So anyway, I have a meeting uh, later this week to go over um, some potential cuts in the police department. Uh, won't be any cuts to personnel other than the, the one that I've already mentioned, which was the information services technician position, that now that work is being handled by the city IT department. Um, but that, so that was one of the cuts uh, for this year. And uh, so I can give you some more details after that meeting, let you know what, what we're looking at cut-wise. But it, it won't be personnel, hopefully. 
uh, some follow-up on the constituency poll from last time. The basketball uh, poll that was down on the field off of center has been, uh, I think the, the owner of that has retrieved that after a visit from her friendly code enforcement officer. Um, and then the yard and waste debris, we've been, uh, we've been dealing with this for way too long uh, in the Copper Basin area. And we finally, through work with planning and got some contact information with Copper Basin. And so the way we've been working with our city attorney on this too, but so Copper Basin is responsible for all of the common areas right now. But uh, once they're done with everything that they're doing there, they'll be turning the responsibility over to the Whispering Hills Homeowners Association. So for right now, it's, it's uh, Copper Basin's responsibility. Uh, Liz Schaefer, the code enforcement officer, was going to contact them to get to clean up the sod uh, right away and then when the snow when uh, the snow melts or uh, we lose enough snow that uh, the rest of the yard waste is visible then uh, she'll have them address that too so keep us posted on what's going on that's all I have Great. thank you Um, so does anyone have any questions about the Okay. I was going to ask a little bit about that smartphone connection. So I did a ride along probably about two months ago now. And uh, during the ride along, a lot of officers told me that it was hard for them to sometimes get to patrolling hours because they would spend a lot of time doing their reports. And maybe, you know, having to go in to look at videos you know, they could kind of look at videos on their smartphones while they're kind of patrolling and keeping an eye on all the streets instead. I think that's a really good thing. Um, so do you think that could, that's going to increase their time out? Um, yeah, I hope so. And they, and yeah, and they can, and they can actually write the reports in their cars. Um, so there's, there's very little that they have to come into the police station for. Um, but so yeah, I, I think the smartphones will will help keep them out in the field longer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? I think we're all too cold. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, committee photos is on the list. We we can choose to take some photos again after this meeting if you want. My amazing camera isn't with me today, so it probably we could wait till next time, or I, we could take some with some of our smartphones. I mean, these days they have great cameras anyway. Um, if you want, but I say we do that after we're done with the poll here. We go around and see what updates people have from their areas. So, um, yeah, Phyllis, do you want to start off? Um, I have nothing to report. Okay, um, just say what area you represent as oh, you go I'm around. Sorry. Uh, Sunnyside Hill. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I'm Sam from ASWCU, representing students, or ASWCU. Um, not a lot. We last semester did a community forum with Shane Emerson, who does the um, College Hill, and then um, some WCU police officers, administrators, and then um, just some students, um, a lot of students of color, just um, trying to create a discussion, kind of like what I mentioned earlier, bridging that gap for students when they first get here. So that was really beneficial to have Shane there. Um, but yeah, we definitely want to try having things like that um, this semester too, and I'd like to develop something that we could use um, to kind of set in place for the beginning of the school year for students. Thank you. Uh, Pioneer Hill. I've had a couple of constituents ask me a question, then I've got a question of my own. Is the uh, Planned Parenthood arsons pretty much cold case right now? It is. Uh, then my question, I've been reading a lot about uh, the State Highway Patrol was having a lot of trouble with recruitment and retention, you know, salary issues and other issues. Is that unique to the Highway Patrol or do we find that in municipal departments as well and is it a problem in Pullman um, you know when I first came here I thought that it we would have serious recruitment problems um, but for one we don't have a lot of turnover in the times that we have had to recruit we have had uh, a lot of good applicants uh, 
so for us, um, I would say we don't have uh, necessarily a recruitment problem. Now, our, our pay compared to um, some other agencies in the region is, is better. So I, I know that some other agencies do have those recruitment problems and turnover problems because of that. So I think as far as in our particular area, we, we sit pretty well as far as how our pay is. Um, so that isn't really a big issue for us. I know that part of Washington State Patrol's issue too is uh, they have a lot of people that are at retirement age and they're losing a lot. Of, they have a lot of attrition going on too. So part of it probably is recruitment, but part of, some of it also is there. I think they're losing a lot of people to retirement, so they're having trouble keeping up. For Sunnyside Hill, I don't have anything else to report. I'm at large and I'm too new to know anything. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing. College Hill, and thankfully nothing at this time. Business, ultimate, nothing. WSU staff, and I don't have anything either. Business representative, nothing to report. The other part of College Hill, not really anything except with students back and cars on the streets and huge earth snow berms and stuff. It's a little, it's it's a little tricky. I keep plotting. Maybe this street should be one way <laughs> because because coming here. Three times I had to pull over into a parking space so somebody could get by. Well, actually, once the other person nicely pulled over, but it's just so small on those streets, particularly in the winter. And I think we talked before about a meeting that uh, we had with Public Works and Fire about uh, parking on College Hill. So Liz put together a uh, a spreadsheet of areas where she saw that signs were missing or if she felt signs should be they should be posted better curbs that were yellow that shouldn't be yellow and curbs that were white that should be yellow and she put that all together and prioritized it we had fire look at it and so it's now in the hands of public works um, I don't expect anything to happen overnight but you know they have now a list to work from well, and I did appreciate the, the piece in the paper about the, the yellow things. And like a day later, I parked right in front of a church that I wanted to go into where it's yellow because I thought, I can park here. Uh, <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> apparently, I could park there then because I didn't get a ticket. <laughs> Give it a few times and then. And yeah, well, sure. it was an unusual circumstance. <laughs> I don't know if you want to be telling chief of police you believe you don't <laughs> not break okay. the law if you don't get caught. <laughs> we need your license plate number. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so on the other half of Pioneer Hill, uh, people are happy. Charlie Brown water towers. Uh, evident again. Yes. And not covered no, and uh, nice. torn up. Uh, <laughs> scaffolding and except charlie's disappeared <gasps> isn't he i mean he's not on there anymore is he oh no he is he's oh, is he? on the side not facing our homes oh, okay <laughs> yeah and then the coyotes are less noisy in lawson gardens as it got colder they don't yak as much i don't recommend walking through it late at night when the coyotes are going crazy but uh you haven't had another one stuck on your fence or anything <laughs> my neighbor called me. I didn't get the call. Two police officers show up at my door. Knock, knock. What time was that? Five in the morning. Five in the morning or something. It's like, uh, well, Richard says there's a coyote stuck in your fence. <laughs> Can we come in and push the coyote off your fence? <laughs> and the answer was yes. <laughs> and uh, you were the instigator. It was pretty really impressive how they did it. He was. He. he I don't know what he tried to, or she had tried to do, but. They went in through your gate there and yes. got behind the coyote and pushed his paws up or her paws up and it got out and ran off. I <laughs> tore my fence up. <laughs> the coyote, not the police. <laughs> so I was glad you helped handle that, Richard. I was reminded of the question while everyone was going around. Um, have there been any further like threats to the mosque um, in this area? And I know I saw a lot of like police cars outside of one of them over or of the one on Stadium Way over break. So I was wondering if anything had happened or. Well, there was a there was a fire in the kitchen area. Oh, okay. I forget exactly when that was. You talked about it last month. 
Okay, it was before last that. meeting. Yeah, that's been the only, uh, and that was accidental. So that's been the only other thing that's happened um, since that one uh, posting on Facebook. Could I ask a question since it was brought up about the yellow lines? I read that article. I didn't understand it at all. <laughs> And I parked in a yellow spot night before last Tuesday. <laughs> Quite brave, <laughs> thinking I don't understand it, but I guess I'll park here. Well, the bottom line is, is yellow curbs are supposed to designate a no parking area. However, over the past I don't know how many years, there's been uh, yellow curbs painted where it isn't necessarily illegal to park. So you can't really tell by looking at the curb color whether it's legal or illegal to park there. I, I, I'm still confused. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Well, that you did should not be. answer my question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if there's, uh, you know, there isn't a good answer for you, um, you know, because there are there are laws about like parking so close to driveways and parking so close to the intersection or a crosswalk, and so you know a lot of those are designated by yellow curbs. But there's other areas where there's yellow curb painted where it is legal to park, and so there isn't a really good way to know. If there's a yellow curb there and I, I guess my advice would be if there's a yellow curb there don't park there well, that's what I would think we've always assumed if it was yellow you didn't park. and we're trying to and that's that's what uh, I was mentioning we've we've gone through and we've uh, identified areas where there's yellow curb that shouldn't be and we're working with public works to try to get those uh, changed so we can't just start randomly parking <laughs> <laughs> no. well you could <laughs> that's one way to find out <laughs> Just say the chief said you could. Okay. <laughs> and that's what I'm trying to avoid. <laughs> Carry the newspaper article with you. There we go. <laughs> All right. Well, um, so do we have any public comment today? None? None at all? Aw. Okay. So next meeting is Monday, February 8th at 5.30 p.m. Um, other than that, since we have no further questions, I think we're good to adjourn this meeting. Right? Yeah. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Do I hear a second? Second? All right. We're adjourned.